My name is Dave Gemmel, and I am not your interim preacher. <laughs> I am your interim, interim preacher. We're in a time of transition here at uh, New Hope Church, and uh, transitions are sometimes, well, a, a little bit difficult in churches, and, and sometimes throughout history they've been difficult. Pastor Kumar uh, taught us last week that even back in Bible times, transitions are difficult when he went from Elijah to Elisha. Elijah had lots of hair. <laughs> Elisha, well, hmm. He also told us that probably a thing not to do when you welcome a new pastor is call him Baldy, all right? So we're going to just leave that right there. There are some things that we can do when we welcome a new pastor into our congregation. And so today we wanted to talk about, uh, about our new pastor while he's not here. And because uh, <laughs> we've already done it, everybody, right? So we might as well do it publicly. Um, and that is, what is the role of the pastor? Um, as we, as we think about that, we're in this countdown now because in two more weeks, we're going to have our brand new senior pastor. Can you say yay, God? Yeah. Can't wait till Mike arrives and uh, God is going to bless his ministry. But let's just back up for a little bit today and kind of talk about the role of the pastor. What is the role of the pastor? What can we expect from our new pastor and... What can he expect from us? That's where we're going today. Now, when I use the word pastor, some of us are familiar with the term. Not everybody's familiar with the term. A lot of times I sit on the airplane, you know, you do this thing where, where are you going and what's your career? And that's that, always that awkward moment for me because I say I'm a pastor and nine times out of ten I'll get this blank look on their face. You know, like, huh? What's that? Sometimes they'll say, is that like a priest? And I say, yeah, but without the superpowers, okay? So what is a pastor? Not everybody can quite figure it out. So we're going to have a little tutorial this morning as far as what is a pastor? What can we expect? What can he expect for us? And this personally is a passion of mine. Some of you may just know me as being the old guy that hangs around a little bit as a volunteer pastor. Um, that is all true. But my real gig, my real paying job, is that I'm passionate about pastors. I'm privileged to serve as the associate director of the ministerial department in the North American Division. My primary role is supporting the 5,000 pastors in the North American Division, from all the way uh, east to Bermuda, to the United States, to Canada, all the way to the west, to Hawaii, and on to Guam and Micronesia. And that's that's my fun job, and I love it because I love pastoring, and I love to support pastors. I've pastored for, for decades, big churches and small churches. Pastoring gets my juices going, so to talk today about pastoring, I'm, I'm, I'm pumped about this. What is a pastor? Quick tutorial. Some famous pastors. We're going to have a little quiz up on the screen. Let's see if we can figure out who the famous pastors are. I'm going to give you several choices, and you tell me which one is a famous pastor. Which of these individuals is the famous pastor. Is it Santa Claus? Is it St. Valentine? Is it Martin Luther King Jr.? Is it all of the above? Is it none of the above? What's the correct answer? The correct answer is all of the above. Santa Claus, a pastor who was famous for giving gifts. Funny thing. St. Valentine was famous because he was the marrying pastor. You get it? Okay. Got to be careful about that. He was also uh, uh, martyred after that. But uh. <laughs> Martin Luther King Jr., we know him as being the civil rights leader, changing the world, changing this country. He was also a pastor in Montgomery, Alabama. So the correct answer is, of course, all of the above. Pastors have made a tremendous contribution to this world in which we live in. Pastors are, are outstanding people, at least in the minds of their kids, sometimes. Three kids were standing in a bus stop in, in, in Nashville, 
And as the, as the boys were talking to each other, they were kind of bragging a little bit about what their moms do. And, and, and the first boy says, you know, my mom is so great that she writes a few words on a piece of paper and she calls it a poem and she sells it for $100. Another boy says, well, my mom is so great that she writes a few words on a piece of paper and she calls it a song and she gets paid hundreds of dollars. Well, the third boy was sitting there and he couldn't quite figure out what to say. And finally it hit him. Well, my mom is so great that she writes a few words on a piece of paper and she calls it a sermon and it takes 20 people to collect the proceeds. <laughs> but most of the time, pastors, we're just legends in our own minds. Um, pastor, what does it mean to be a pastor? Pastoring is actually one of the most difficult jobs in the world. Peter Drucker tells us that the four hardest jobs in the world are the President of the United States, University President, CEO of a hospital, pastor of a large church. And I have to uh, agree with that, although I haven't had the other three positions. But it is very, very difficult, particularly in the times in which we live right now. Pastoring is, is a challenge. We're living in difficult times. The trust of pastors has eroded over the years because there's been some, some rotten tomatoes in our midst. Uh, there's been priests that have molested children. There's pastors that have taken advantage of trust relationships and congregations and, and, uh, and had inappropriate relationships with members in the congregation and have taken money out of the offering plate. And all of those things add up and begin to erode and corrode the trust in pastors. Put on top of that is this, this incredible job description as far as what we expect out of our pastors. It's, it's, it's one of the most difficult job descriptions in the world. I'm, in fact, let me just read you a job description of a, of a, um, of a normal search committee as they're going out. Uh, actually, this was a, I took a picture of a New Hope search committee. Um, and here's some of the things that are on the list here for the search committee. Our pastor must be a strong administrator, charismatic leader, inspiring preacher, effective teacher, wise, empathetic counselor, person of vision, have a public presence, reach up, reach down, reach in, reach out, welcome people, visit people, marry people, bury people, baptize people, affirm people, encourage people, chair committees, read vociferously, stay relevant, use her humor, but not too much. Uh, thrive on criticism, lead a balanced life, go into hyperspeed during the holidays, faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound, look up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane, it is super pastor. That is the job description of a pastor. Well, if anybody really buys into that fantasy, they're going to be deeply disappointed when the pastor or the congregation crashes and burns because it's a job description that doesn't work out. In fact, it doesn't work out. Here's a few stats on pastors. Lifeway Ministries tells us that for every 20 people who go into the pastorate, only one actually retires from ministry. So 19 out of 20 don't make it from beginning to end. This really hit me hard as, as I was uh, part of the search committee. I had the privilege of, of going out and, and doing recruiting for a new senior pastor uh, at New Hope Church. And I'll be honest with you, I started looking for some of the, the best and the brightest minds out there, pastors that were out there. These are friends of mine. And I would tell them what a wonderful church New Hope was. And they said, yeah, I believe it. I know what it is. I've heard about it. Well, would you consider putting your name in the hat for it? And they said, Dave, let me tell you honestly, no. Why? Because I don't want to work that hard. And about 20 people dropped off the list because of that. Pastoring is hard, and it's getting harder, and it's getting more difficult to find pastors. Our own Ansel Oliver did some sleuthing a, a, a few months back, and here's what he discovered. Within a few years, 50% of NA, 
D pastors will be eligible for retirement. We're looking for 2,500 more pastors within the next few years. We're reaching a crisis. And it's difficult. What's the solution? I would like to suggest that what we need to do is put aside all of our preconceptions of what a pastor is or what a pastor should be. And let's just do a little time travel today. Just you know, put aside any pastor that you've ever known, any stories that you've ever heard, good or bad. Go back in time before the 19th century, before the Middle Ages. Go all the way back to the early Christian church. And if we anchor ourselves there, I think we can find kind of a radical picture of what a pastor is about. And it may be quite surprising. So if you have your Bible today, I'd like to invite you to turn to Ephesians chapter 4. And we'll be reading uh, the passage. We're going to zoom in on uh, the entire passage, but particularly verse 11. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. So, Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. Here's a list of spiritual gifts. Now, some of you that are students of early Christian history, you know that this is not just uh, uh, the only list of spiritual gifts in the Bible. Uh, you may be familiar with some other lists, and I've got them up on the screen now. Romans chapter 12 gives another long list. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we could go to other passages as well. Now, take a look at the list up on the screen. What's the difference between the lists that Paul gives in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, and Ephesians chapter 4? What's the difference? What's the difference between the lists? One of them is, is a bigger list, right? And one of them is a smaller list, okay? Notice that many of the gifts in Ephesians 4 are listed in the others, but there's some gifts that are not listed there. So why is it that he has just a few gifts listed in this passage in Ephesians chapter 4? Why is that? I think we can find out if we continue reading the rest of the verse. These are special gifts, and the rest of the verse says these gifts are given to equip his people for works of service. The apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the shepherd, the teacher. I like to call these the catalytic gifts. They're no better, they're no worse than any other gifts, but they are qualitatively different. They serve a different purpose in the body of Christ. Um, I like to view church as, as kind of like a chemistry set. And we have some mad scientists with us today. I'd like to involve, uh, invite our mad scientists up over here. And they are going to show us how the church is like a chemistry set. And they have in their hands, oh, let's first introduce ourselves. Who is mad scientist number one? Your name is? Thomas. Thomas. Mad scientist number two is? Isaac. Isaac. And this looks like a radical experiment because you have safety goggles on. So I may stand back on this. Before we run the experiment, though, we have, what is this over here? This looks like a bottle of uh, soda pop. And why don't you, oh, yes. All right, when Vanna retires, you're hired. Go ahead and pull the, the lid off of that uh, that. Oh, I can hear it. I can hear it. Uh, oh, I see it. There's, there's some bubbles. So we know that inside here, I believe, is some gas that is compressed inside this. And if we watch very carefully, we can see all those little bubbles beginning to, to try to escape. And we're going to come back to that for a moment. But I visualize that the church is filled with spiritual gifts. All of us are in that bottle, and we all have spiritual gifts. And as, those, as, as we're exposed to the world, those spiritual gifts begin to, to work, and we can see them. And if we left that bottle out for about 24 hours, we would see that all of those spiritual gifts had, had been, been activated. Um, but I know that some of you don't want to wait for 24 hours, do you? 
Sometimes in life, God gives us these spiritual gifts and, and over hours or weeks or months or years, these spiritual gifts are activated and then they come to life and it happens. But what if, what if there were some special spiritual gifts that activated the other spiritual gifts? What would happen? Let's find out and see what indeed what happened when you put the catalytic gifts with the other gifts. Uh, okay. All right. And we will be needing the spiritual gift of helps here later on today, I'm sure. All right. Thank you very much, gentlemen. So we can see that in a very short time, these spiritual gifts have become active and, and vibrant uh, in, the, in the community, in the life of the church. These are the catalytic gifts. Let's go to the catalytic gifts for a moment and kind of explore those uh, and find out what it is that Paul is talking about these. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. The first one, and by the way, the English words here, um, sometimes they, they may not be real accessible. The first English word is, is apostle. Is that a word that you use every day in, in life? Hey, how you doing, apostle? Probably not. If I use the word pastor on the airplane, I get a few strange looks. If, I, if they ask me what I am, I'm an apostle. Okay, they may throw me off the plane. Um, so what is an apostle? An apostle actually is an old Greek word, and it comes from the maritime industry, the, 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 uh, the, the navy and what the apostle was is the person that put the navy fleet together to go out into conquest. Later on in Jewish circles, they used it to, to talk about a leader that had been commissioned for a task. And Jesus uses it very much in that sense, when he commissions disciples to do something. What, if we were to use this word today in English, it would be an authorized leader. So a leader is basically what that gift is. How about the next gift, the gift of prophet? Try that one on an airplane sometime. What do you do for a living? I'm a prophet. <clears throat> All right. Uh, a prophet, to go back, is, is we think of prophecy as someone who foretells the future, kind of like a fortune teller. But that's not the meaning of the word prophet at all. Prophet is someone who speaks on behalf of God or speaks the word of God. If we were to translate that today in regular understandable English, it would be the preacher. The gift of prophecy is the gift of taking the word of God and preaching it. How about the next gift, the gift of evangelist? That's a word that rarely occurs anywhere and only a couple times in Scripture. An evangelist literally means someone who is, carries good news or someone who exudes good news. Someone who is so pumped about mercy and about the grace of God that he just can't help or she just can't help but talking about it. So we would kind of translate that today, preacher of grace. Next one's a little bit easier for us to understand. If you're on an airplane and someone asks you what you do, and say, I'm a shepherd. Okay, they've got that one figured out. You herd sheep. You take sheep into places where there's green pastures. Now today, probably a, a better understanding would be the word pastor. That's what pastor means. Taking a congregation to places where they can get fed. And then the final one is teacher. Now, if you're on an airplane, you say, I'm a teacher. You're in luck. So today we will translate the word teacher to teacher. The gift of being able to teach the Bible. Now, all of these gifts are the catalytic gifts. These are the gifts that enable someone to release the rest of the gifts in the body of Christ. So, for example, as we take a look at our contemporary understanding of what a pastor is in this setting, basically a pastor is someone that has these gifts. And the concept of the pastor, what is, what is the end Result of this, we can continue reading in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12. So that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, 
attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So these special gifts are the gifts that occur in the contemporary pastor. The pastor is not Superman. The pastor has supernatural gifts of God. There's a great difference between those two. Supernatural gifts. So, what does that look like? Well, in a catalyst reaction, the catalyst is not used up when it's put with the other ingredients. And so it is with these catalytic gifts. If a church is functioning well, you don't use up the pastor. You don't burn out the pastor. The pastor is there to let the congregation find their gifts and discover it. Church is not a spectator sport. Church is not entertainment where we watch the preacher preach and if we like what we hear, we cheer. If we don't, we jeer. Church is more like a sports team where the team gets out there and takes the ball down the court, takes the puck down the ice, takes the ball down the field, but the coach never even touches the ball. That's what church is about. And that's what the gift of the pastor is all about. And it makes sense. Because some of our misunderstandings of what the pastor is all about, they, they simply are mathematically impossible. Let's say we finally find a pastor that says, okay, I will work. Maybe not as hard as you like, but I will work. I will take this position. Say we find a pastor that's willing to work, say, 40 hours a week, okay? All right, very good. So what if we can find a super pastor that's willing to work 50 hours a week? How much production comes out of our congregation? Well, we get 50 hours of production. But what if we flip that whole thing upside down and say instead of the pastor, you're not going to do the work of the church. We're going to do the work of the church. We want you to equip us. We want you to help us discover what our spiritual gifts are, to equip us and grow our spiritual gifts so that we can do the ministry that God has called us to do. Say we had 700 people that were willing to do four hours of week, letting their spiritual gifts fly, 2,800 hours, if you're just going to take this from a business model, from volunteerism, can you see how much more powerful this Bible concept of spiritual gifts, these catalytic gifts, that's, that's about the gist of it as far as what the Bible teaches about the job description of the pastor. And I think if we stick with that, we're going to be in really, really, really good shape. Um, I want to just share with you now that we've talked about the job description of the pastor. Um, I'm going to go out on thin ice right now, and, and, and the rest of this sermon is something that uh, Mike Spiegel is smart enough not to preach about. And that is, what is the job description of the congregation? All right? I, like I said, interim, interim, pastor, <laughs> okay? Take out your bulletin, and inside the bulletin today, you should have a, a card and that card, it should say 10 things that pastors wish their churches would do. Take out that card. And this is kind of, uh, I'm going to get you into the drill of how Pastor Mike likes to preach. He likes to have uh, fill-in-the-blank things. So I'm just kind of getting you up, up to speed on it so when he comes, he won't be surprised. All right? So beg, borrow, or steal a pen or a pencil from your neighbor, neighbor and let's begin to, to figure out what this is. This is the dream congregation. And while we're doing that, let me just say a few words of preface before this. I've pastored uh, eight different congregations over the years. And let me say that of all the congregations that I've ever been involved with, New Hope has this figured out the best. So this is not a chance to say, okay, we need to, we need to get it together. I'm saying, hey, I think that we are doing pretty well here. So as we take a look at this, I want to reaffirm to our congregation what our expectations are, and I believe that if we follow these expectations, which we have been, I think we're going to have a great relationship with our new pastor. So, you ready? Let's take these one by one. 
whip out your pen. And the first one is pray. Pray for your pastor. The pastor is the spiritual catalyst for the church. That makes the pastor a great big target for the enemy. Pray for the pastor's spiritual health. Pray for protection. Pray for wisdom. Pray that the catalytic gifts of apostleship, prophecy, teaching, evangelism, and shepherding will grow strong in your pastor. And the most affirming words that every pastor wants to hear is, Pastor, I'm praying for you every day. Second one, affirm your pastor. Pastoring may be one of the most difficult jobs in the world these days. And here's why. Pastors live in a highly concentrated environment where they see the results of sin on a daily basis through caring for humanity. While the average person may see a death, an injury, or an illness, or a family conflict occasionally, the pastor lives through these things on a weekly basis. That's our lives. That's what we see. Highly concentrated. Though pastors don't live for affirmation, words of validation do provide a lifeline of strength through treacherous times. And those little notes saying, Pastor, you're making a difference, may be the very thing that helps your pastor make it through another day. Number three, bless the pastoral family. Pastoral stress leaks into families and is enough to test all family bonds. Throw in a few wild expectations about how pastoral spouses and pastoral kids are supposed to behave, and you have a recipe for a family meltdown. The antidote is the blessing. Bless the spouse. Bless the kids. Let go of any expectations and treat the family with the rich blessing of heaven's grace. And of course, to relieve the financial pressure, return a faithful tithe so that the pastor is secure in getting a regular paycheck. Number four, release the pastor from constant ministry so renewal can take place. Pastors who go 24-7 for days, for weeks, for months on end will inevitably self-destruct. Mandate that your pastor takes weekly breaks for spiritual renewal as well as an annual extended break for study leave and vacation. It's a small price to pay for the rich spiritual energy that comes as a result of regularly releasing your pastor from ministry. Number five, fill in the blank. What do you suppose it's going to say? Talk with your pastor and not about <laughs> or around the pastor. Complaining about the pastor to someone else is corrosive for the entire church family. Writing anonymous critical notes to the pastor are acts of spiritual terrorism. You know what I do with anonymous notes? I throw them away. I don't even read them. If you have a problem with the pastor, talk directly to the pastor and try to work it out. If resolution can't be found, then bring a, a spiritual leader with you and seek resolution. And then, and only then, if resolution is not found, bring together a larger group to dialogue with the pastor. Here's rule of thumb, challenge privately, affirm publicly. Number six, write in the word forgive. Forgive your pastor for falling short of your expectations because no pastor will perfectly satisfy your ideals. Remember that your vision of what a pastor should be is probably unique to you. Everyone else in the congregation also has unique expectations. And many of the expectations are mutually exclusive. Your pastor will also make some mistakes. All pastors do. Extend to your pastor the same grace that God extends to you. And if your pastor knows that he or she practices ministry in a safe, grace-filled congregation where risk-taking is expected and stagnancy is deplored, your church can become spiritually turbocharged. 
Number seven, feed yourself spiritually. Don't expect to live on a limited spiritual diet of 30-minute weekly sermons. Going seven days without eating makes one week. Even with the best of sermons, you will spiritually starve to death. The role of the shepherd is not to stick grass in the mouths of the sheep, but to lead the sheep to green pastures. As you listen to the great sermons that your pastor preaches, may you be inspired to get into the word yourself every day in prayer. And number eight, bond. Bond with a small group. Don't expect the primary pastoral care to come from the pastor, particularly in a church this size. It's mathematically impossible. And primary care is not his or her role. Regular spiritual support occurs in small groups. When you're plugged into weekly small groups, you will grow together, pray for one another, care for one another, support one another through all the ups and downs of life. The pastoral staff and lay pastors can serve as a safety net for those who are not in small groups, as well as care for those in life transitions. Number nine, follow the leader. Now, the pastor is not the CEO of the congregation. That role is reserved for who? Jesus. Jesus is the head of the church. However, the pastor has been given the gift of apostleship, leadership, and you should take your cue from the pastor and follow after Jesus. Let your pastor lead. With leadership comes change. Things will be different around here. They always have been. Since the founding of the church, and this church founded by HMS Richards, junior, senior, first, second, third, anyway, that famous guy, um, God has brought a succession of quality pastors into this church, each one with leadership to take your church to the next level. God gives your pastor vision. Help the pastor flesh out the vision, and then do your part to take the vision into reality. And a little footnote here. Don't harass previous pastors. Some of them are dead. Uh, some of them are still around. Some have moved on. Let them move on. Don't harass them. And number 10, exercise your spiritual gifts. Pastoral gifts don't do much by themselves. However, if you let those catalytic gifts energize your gifts, you will come alive spiritually. Let the pastor equip you so that your church family can reach unity in the faith and knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Take advantage of the teaching and ministry opportunities at your church. Place yourself in optimal places for spiritual growth. Well, you can fire me. That was the sermon as far as what every pastor's expectations are of a congregation. Uh, pastor Mike won't probably be preaching that sermon, but, but, but tuck this away. Keep it in a safe place because there are times that, that all of us will need to come back to that and refresh our memory as far as what the biblical role of the senior pastor is in the congregation. Some of you today, if you take a look at the bottle over here, some of you today are deep in this bottle and you have been bubbling and fomenting and your spiritual gift is alive and is active for months and maybe even years here at New Hope Church. And I want to affirm you for that and keep it going. In fact, most here in church, in New Hope Church, many have, have found that place of ministry. Some of you Maybe the last few months, maybe even the last year or so, have been just kind of taking a, taking a little break from ministry. Kind of a wait-and-see attitude. You know, what's New Hope going to do? Where are we going? What's the new vision? What's our direction? Where's our leader going to take us? I want to encourage you in the next couple of weeks to pray about jumping back into the bottle and being prepared to let our new pastor energize your spiritual gifts 
and get them alive and well and functioning again so that we can follow after that new vision. We can help shape that new vision together and take us where God wants us to go. Some of you may have never heard of spiritual gifts. This is, this is kind of talk that is church talk and you're not familiar with it. I want to encourage you to, to take some time and study a little bit. Go back to Ephesians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, maybe even this afternoon. Read those passages of Scripture. Pray over those passages of Scripture and pray that God will reveal to you what He wants to do in your life, what your spiritual gifts are, and then be prepared to jump into the scene. Put yourself in optimal places where you can be equipped for ministry. Being exposed to the weekly sermons of Pastor Mike. Being involved in ministry opportunities as they come along. Trying things out. Some are going to work, some aren't going to work. Until you begin to, to realize what your gifts are. Joining a small group where they can help you understand where your gifts are. And get in the game. And you will begin to bubble and, and spring up as the Holy Spirit inspires your life and connects you with the supernatural gifts that he has for you. I just invite you right now to, to bow your heads and, and, and pray with me as we listen to the word of God here in Scripture. Lord Jesus, you have brought these spiritual gifts. You've promised these spiritual gifts to us, the gifts of apostleship, the gifts of pastoring, the gifts of prophecy, the gifts of evangelism, the gifts of teaching. And we know those gifts are going to come alive when Pastor Mike joins us in a couple weeks. We pray that you'll bless him in this, this final rest that he has before he comes. And we pray, Lord, that you'll help us discover what our gifts are so that we can become alive and well and growing and prospering and bubbling in your goodness and your grace. Maybe there's someone here today that uh, has given everything to this church and is feeling a little bit tired. I pray, that, Lord, that you'll bless that person right now. Give them the energy that they need to have a renewed spirit and renewed gifts. Maybe there's someone here today that's been kind of sitting on the sideline waiting to see where you're going to lead. I pray that you'll encourage them to, to jump back in the game again and be energized and, and uh, innervated and excited and bubbling with the gifts that you have given them. And maybe there's someone here today, maybe visiting for the first time today, may not even know what spiritual gifts are. I pray that even right now your Holy Spirit can, can bless their hearts um, and help them to understand that you have gifts for them as well. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.